A great institution of the Hebrew Bible is the tabernacle. And it's wonderful to see how the articles point to Jesus Christ, at least the furniture, in terms of the Greek New Testament. Uh, I would like to focus on that whole tabernacle, but also the hilasterion and the veil, and how Christ fulfills both of those. But first of all, with a brief overview of the tabernacle and how it points to Christ, we have the brazen altar on the outside of the tent of meeting. And this, I believe, in terms of the New Testament, represents Christ our sacrifice. Animals were sacrificed there. Uh, and I'm thinking of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, where by one sacrifice forever, he completes all the sacrificial system that was pointing to that. Secondly, the, la the, la the labor is where the priests would wash their hands before going in to the holy place. Again, as we look at Jesus Christ, we're told in 1 John 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus Christ can represent, I believe, our cleansing, our spiritual cleansing through what he's done in his sacrifice upon the cross. Then as we move into the holy place, we come to the lampstand, the menorah, which would provide light in the holy place for the priests, and historically was no doubt a type of how Israel was to be the light in the world uh, at that time. It is interesting, as we move into the New Testament, a Christ who is the perfect embodiment of Israel is the light of the world. And we're told in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Thinking again of the menorah having its ultimate application in Christ, who is that eternal light. Then we have in the holy place, the table of showbread, the lechem panim, the bread of the presence. And here, we would have the 12 loaves pointing to the sustenance in the way that, that God would take care of his people. In the New Testament, I see this fulfilled in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 29, where Christ is our, can I say, Passover. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are constantly thinking of Christ as our spiritual sustenance of the broken body and what it represents and the spiritual food that we have in Jesus Christ. Then we have the altar of incense, which was right before the veil where the priests would burn incense uh, and it would go into, the smell would go into the Holy of Holies, Kodesh Kodeshim. It is interesting that I believe this is a beautiful picture of Christ our intercessor. As we look at Romans 8, 34, we're told that we have intercession through Jesus Christ. He's died for us, he, he's arisen, he's alive, and he constantly is making intercession. So we have a high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us, we're told also in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. Then we have the veil, and I'm going to allude to the veil uh, more fully in just a moment, but the veil, I believe, points to the access into God's presence, and we'll see this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, where we'll see that the body of Christ is that access through his death into the Father's presence. Inside the veil, we have the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and the Ark of the Covenant is like a box that contains the Ten Commandments, or I should say the two tables of the Torah, the law, and I believe representing Christ as the fulfillment of the law. 
in Matthew 5, 17, he said, don't think I've come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, even to a yod and a tittle. The mana, the manna, represents Christ as our heavenly bread. It was interesting, the manna is what the Lord fed the people of Israel as they were going out of Egypt into the promised land. And it is interesting, in John chapter 6, Christ is that final manna. Come down from heaven. And by the way, the rabbis said when Messiah comes, he'll bring the manna back. And I believe Christ, John is telling us, is that manna. Christ claimed to be the bread of life come down from heaven. That as we eat of his, uh, can I say, spiritual bread through his death and resurrection, we have eternal life as we believe that. Then we have Aaron's rod that budded, that was also in the box of the covenant. And I believe that looks at the priesthood, the living priesthood of Christ based upon his resurrection. In other words, he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And I love that text in <coughs> Hebrews and also in Psalm 110. Nishba Adonai Belo Yenachem, Atachochem, La Ulam Al Dibrati Melchizedek. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The writer of Hebrews will drive that point home in Hebrews chapter 7 <laughs> that we have a perpetual priesthood in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, unlike Aaron's, because the priests would die. But now we have a priest who will never die, who has conquered death, and who is that eternal priest. And then, as we think about the Holy of Holies, on the lid of the altar, we had the mercy seat, what is called in Hebrew, the kafadah, and two kerevim, cherubim, overlooking it on either side. And I believe that is a picture of Christ as our propitiation as our satisfaction. Blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat every Yom Kippur, or Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, and the priest would offer a bullock for himself, something that Jesus did not have to do because he who knew no sin became a sin offering for us. So he didn't have to offer a sacrifice for himself, uh, because of sin, because he was without sin. He was sinless. But he then pictures, or, or this pictures, the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement that he offered on Calvary for all who will believe in him. And that is where we get the word hilasterion. That is, that was the lid in where the blood was sprinkled. The Greek word hilasterion is the translation of the Hebrew word uh, kafar. And it's looking, I believe, at satisfaction, at what we could call justification. God is now satisfied that a sacrifice has been made and a final sacrifice through the blood of Christ who dies upon the cross, making that final sacrifice. So that goat is picturing that and Christ fulfills it. By the way, speaking of the vicarious atonement, I think it's all through the Hebrew Bible, to be honest. Uh, all the way through the sacrificial system, you had a substitute. And now that final substitute, can I say, is Jesus Christ. So by way of type in the sacrifice of Yom Kippur, the goat, it's pointing, once the hands was laid upon it, the priest laying hands on it, representing the people, it has its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, who took our sins upon himself. As Paul says, he who knew no sin became a sin offering for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we have, in 1 John 1, 9, he is the satisfaction, the chilasmas, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. In other words, he died can I say, a universal atonement, but it's effective for those who are truly putting their faith in Jesus Christ. It's available for all, but only efficacious when one by faith is willing to receive it 
And so as we look at, at the New Testament, especially in Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, we have that statement about the hilasterion. And I'm going to translate it from the Greek New Testament. It's a great text. It says, being justified, dekaiumenoi dorean, freely, by his grace, through the redemption, and I love that word, apalutros, apalutrosaos, through the price that was paid, through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now we have hilasterio, which or whom God placed in advance a hilasterio, through faith in his blood, unto the demonstration of his righteousness. In other words, Jesus Christ becomes that lid, that hilasterion, through which his blood is represented as removing our sins. And, and I think that word encompasses two ideas. If it's covered, and kafar is the word to atone, in Hebrew, that's where we get the, the lid as the kafara. If it's covered, I believe it looks at complete uh, satisfaction. God doesn't see it anymore. And we could also, also say expiation, removal. Although I believe the second goat also beautifully pictures expiation, where the goat is taken out and uh, it's removed. So I think we have both ideas on the Day of Atonement. But that lid, that kafara, that hilasterion, could also encompass, I believe, God's propitiation through the blood of Christ, through his sacrifice upon the cross, and his removal, his expiation of our sins when we put our faith in him as Lord and Savior. But then, as we look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, the writer of Hebrews is a wonderful, it's a wonderful book showing the greatness of Jesus Christ and what he's done in his sacrifice, in his work, how he's established a new covenant. So in that great book, in Hebrews chapter 10, as we're looking at verse 19 of Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the most holy place into the entrance we could say of the holy holiest place by the blood of christ which he has made a way for us a way through his own sacrifice a way into the holy of holies which is heaven itself and he has gone we are told through the veil and the word veil here Katapetasmatas is looking at that veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. But the writer of Hebrews tells us that the flesh of Christ has now become the veil. It, he goes on to say, which is really uh, the flesh of Jesus Christ, uh, who has become that veil that has opened the way into the holy of holies. And one of the great moments of the crucifixion, when Jesus said, it is to tell us thy, it is finished, the veil of the temple was rent in, in, in two places. It was rent in twain, as the old King James says. In other words, it was divided and it was open. And as a result, we now can go in to the Holy of Holies. It's permanently open because of what Christ has accomplished upon the cross. So as we look at these two uh, specific words that I've highlighted, hilasterion, uh, place of atonement, and as we look at the word veil, Christ represents both. He's opened the way by making that final place of atonement and by opening the veil where we can go into his presence anytime. May we, first of all, make sure that our faith is rooted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he now has become the mediator then, if that is the case, between us and the Father. He is our access.
He is our, can I say, open veil. And he has accomplished this through his helasterion, through his propitiatory sacrifice for our sins by his death upon the cross. And we have redemption, Paul will say, therefore, through his blood, which he has fulfilled all that the Yom Kippur uh, sacrifice was pointing to. May we worship Christ and adore him for what he has done uh, in making this possible to have eternal salvation through faith in him as Lord and Savior.